Asia's heart and soul can be found in its numerous small towns, but their character and their very existence are at risk of being washed away by tide and time. This week on CNA Correspondent, we uncover the hopes and fears of these small towns. This is a small coastal municipality along the Philippines' northwestern coast. One that visitors usually pass through en route to other places. The nation's capital, Manila, lies about five and a half hours' drive south. It has a handful of white sand beaches which draw some tourists, but locals here rely on the sea for another reason. Salt. The Seoul prides itself as the Philippines' source of quality sea salt, and it is also my ancestors' hometown. Over here, salt is sold in sacks along the roads. This group of buyers come from a neighboring province, and they are regular customers. The person they're buying salt from is 72-year-old the Sol native Bonifacio Verasosa. He's been a salt farmer for 30 years, and he takes comfort in leading a simple life. Forty-one-year-old Michael Versosa has over a decade's experience of being a salt farmer. Today, he works with his wife to feed their three children. Ang kwan lang dito, may rapang pera, pagtagulan. Yon, tatalagang walang anak buhay. Lagi na umulan, lagi mumabagyo, o di. Wala, hindi ka makakapaghanap buhay ng maayos. Pag may bagyo, lalo nung lumalakas kasi yung mga bagyo ngayon eh. Kaya, wala, yun lang naman yung ano. Di ba, pag may bagyo dito, lakas talaga. Traditional rock salt making relies on the sun and the sea. The water here comes directly from the sea, and it is the sun that's responsible for the evaporation that aids in salt formation. When oceans are polluted and extreme weather disturbances are prevalent, it is small coastal communities like the Seoul and industries that rely on nature like salt making that are most affected. Michael shows me the proper way to rake the salt beds. The crucial step is to dry out the sea water so there can be a daily harvest. That would take some two months. But it all ends when the rainy season arrives. Backbreaking labor aside, there's an emerging threat to salt making. And that's microplastics from plastic pollution, which has reached the ocean. It doesn't matter how the waste management system is. Uh, it really is about the amount of consumption of these goods that are packaged in plastic. But one thing we do know is that um, experts and doctors have sort of raised concerns about the exposure of people to chemical additives in plastic and, of course, microplastics. It's still unclear how microplastics will affect the sea salt. But Michael is already concerned. Galing din sa dagat dahil dagat din yung pinagkukuhanan namin yung tubig na ginagawang asin. Sa dagat din. Kaya dapat lang na huwag tayong magkalat sa dagat natin. One way to do that is through mangrove reforestation. I travel with the Seoul's agriculturist to the town's mangrove conservation site. Agriculturist Maria Frieda Briz says the site can potentially generate income for the town as it is being touted as an eco park. 
Although kumukuha pa lang kami ng information kung ano yung mga migratory birds na nandito, baka sooner or later magkaroon na tayo ng bird watching. At saka ano, uh, pwede na rin maging campsite itong in the near future. Actually, nung inopen ito, ang dami nilang nakikitang mga shells, yung, yung lukan, yung mga gano'n, na species, marami pang iba. Tapos yung, ano, yung mangrove crab na kasi ang tawag dun sa mud crab eh. So, bali, parang araw-araw, meron ka na makikita sa palengke, dinadala na doon yung, ano. Large portions of land are converted for agricultural and industrial use. The same is true in coastal communities where biodiversity-rich areas like mangrove forests and wetlands are used for aquaculture like fish ponds. But because of mangrove conservation efforts here in the Sol, you can see the natural regeneration of mangrove species behind me, which in turn benefit the fishing community as it provides for a natural habitat for a richer and wider range of aquatic species. Locals hope the move will allow them and future generations to stay on in the salt, even as ocean pollution and typhoons threaten their livelihoods. Siyempre, kailangan kumayod para may pangkain kami, pangkain sila. Yung mga pamilya ko, sila ang inspirasyon ko para magtrabaho kahit na bumabagyo. Like many Filipinos, family, after all, is the reason why many opt to stay here in the Seoul, where the pace of life is low, rewards paltry, and the challenges are plenty. This was once an active underwater volcano millions of years ago. The ancient Nglangran volcano is now extinct, forming a dramatic backdrop to Pitu, the sole village near its eastern peak. It's a steep, bumpy 30-minute ride to the seven-hectare village, which is sometimes seen as cursed by outsiders. Pitu means seven in Javanese language and there is a divine belief that only seven families are allowed to live in this remote settlement. Ah! Village elder Yatno Rejo says villagers follow this tradition strictly out of fear of the consequences. <laughs> Desa sini tidak sasaran selalu kalau tidak kesan itu menjadikan penyakit kalau tidak lalu pindah itu menjadikan sakit tersangat menjadikan tinggal. The 82-year-old recalls occasions when outsiders tried to settle in Pitu. They faced the hardship and eventually left. Though so far, he says, no one had to pay the ultimate price of death. The exact origins of Pitu's mysticism are unclear. But the villagers say the seven-family rule follows the Quranic teaching that there are seven universes. They believe Pitu village is at the center of the universe and they must preserve its balance. In the past, this used to be a lake and legend has it that the gods used the water to bathe their flying horses. Some villagers actually claimed to have seen these winged beasts. The lake is now a paddy field and a well under a banyan tree provides water for the entire village. Here, villagers are preparing for a Javanese ritual called Tingalan. The ritual is to ask for protection, well-being and longevity for Retno Dilmulio, the oldest among the 32 residents in Pitu. The 105-year-old is the village's key holder and in poor health. The ceremony is attended by the seven heads of families in Pitu and food is divided into seven portions equally. 
The number of heads of families must always remain the same, even though the number of villagers isn't fixed. Misalnya, saya punya anak dua. Terus anak pertama nikah. Yaitu nanti tergantung si anak. Si anak mau ke tempat lain atau tinggal di sini. Kami sebagai kepala keluarga tidak bisa mencegah atau menghalangi keinginannya mau tinggal apa mau pindah. Kalau mau pindah ya tidak apa-apa. Tapi kalau misalnya mau tinggal di sini itu jadi satu ke kepala keluarga sebelumnya atau menggantikan kepala keluarga sebelumnya seperti itu. Tri Harnadi is the latest addition to Pitu. The 32-year-old outsider got married to a P2 woman and is now one of the seven heads of families in the village. Dulu memang uh, tinggal di desa terbah karena dikarenakan mertua sudah usia tua, terus turun menggantikan posisi menjadi anggota kepala keluarga dan saya mengijai karena melihat orang tua mertua itu sudah kelihatan rentah jadi saya bersedia untuk bergabung di kampung tujuh But life in the isolated village can be lonely. The seven families are spread far apart and the nearest village is a few kilometers away. Five-year-old Arsia has few friends though her mother ensures she's never alone. Soalnya nanti sambil ngerjain apa ya sama Arsi. Jadi ngikut terus kemana-mana ikut, ke sawah ikut, nyuci ikut, nyapu ikut. Penting sekali soalnya juga untuk perkembangan pertumbuhan Arsi sendiri untuk bisa bersosialisasi nantinya. Growing up here can feel like being cut off from the rest of civilization. In 2015, P2 finally got access to electricity, but rain and lightning frequently disrupt power supply. And this in turn affects the internet connection, making it harder for younger residents like 18-year-old Brian to keep up with school. Dulu waktu kecil pas SD, Pak itu aksesnya masih cukup susah. Terus kadang dulu tuh pas musim hujan juga sering pas mau berangkat sekolah itu jalan kaki. Itu kurang lebih 2 kiloan. Brian who is studying tourism management wants to stay and develop P2 from a farming community to a travel destination. The village may be cursed with seclusion, but it's blessed with clean air and beautiful surroundings. This is the eastern peak of Mount Purba Ngelanggaran. Pitu village is just one kilometer from the summit. Visitors can come here to catch both sunrise and sunset and enjoy the amazing views. Thousands of visitors come to Pitu each year. The village is in Gunung Kidul Regency and the local authorities tread a fine line between promoting tourism and preserving Pitu's ancestral heritage. Kalau mau berkunjung silahkan, menginap tidak gitu. Menginapnya tapi di, di homestay yang ada di sekitar kampung Pitu. Karena kita menjaga historinya ya, menjaga ya, tradisi yang sudah berjalan selama ini. The plan is to transform P2 village into a living museum which could attract more visitors. Bagaimana cara mereka menggunakan uh, ageman Jawa, kemudian kehidupan mereka, bagaimana cara memasak, kemudian arsitektur uh, perumahannya, kemudian bagaimana mereka bergotong royong, berperilaku dan masih mempertahankan ada tradisi di sana kalau misalnya Di sisi adat itu ada upacara-upacara adat, mereka masih melakukan dengan baik. Inilah uh, yang akan coba kami gambarkan uh, uh, di Kampung Pitu ini. The seven families hope that by giving visitors a taste of life at their sacred village, this could mean a new dawn for Pitu and reinvigorate their remote settlement.
nestled among the foothills of a mountain range about an hour's drive from Malaysia's capital Kuala Lumpur lies Kuala Kubu Baru, popularly known as KKB. Now, this century-old sleepy town was described by architecture buffs as the best-kept secret in town planning. Designed from scratch by British journalist turned town planner Charles Compton Reid in 1920s, the only entrance to the town is through a park lined with trees. Visitors are greeted by two-story pre-war shop houses and the district office and police station are perched on the hill, providing a panoramic view of the town centre. This clock tower overlooking the Kuala Kubu Baru town centre was built in 1937 to commemorate King George VI, who's the father of the reigning Queen Elizabeth II. The century-old post office is still in use today, but the Quotes Theatre, the only cinema here, has been closed for years. The fire station, meanwhile, has been turned into a tourist information centre, offering a glimpse of the town's heyday. Now, the origin of Kuala Kubu Old Town before this new one was built in 1926 was shrouded in mystery. Known as a sunken town, legend has it that in 1883, a young British officer by the name of Cecil Ranking killed a white crocodile that's believed to be the guardian of the river. Now, a nearby dam broke soon after, submerging the entire town of Kuala Kubu. Subsequently, the town was rebuilt, but it was hit by frequent floods due to increased mining activities upstream. In 1926, after the entire town was submerged by severe floods, the British government decided to abandon the old town and move to a higher ground, giving rise to the birth of a new town, Kuala Kubu Baru. Today, it's regarded as one of the most charming towns in the country. To mitigate flooding, weirs were built along rivers to slow down the flow of water, while many pre-war shop houses were elevated with steps and some rest on stilts. Now this historical building that was converted from an old government quarters, it's about 80 years old and it now houses the Historical Society of Kuala Kubu, run by like-minded historians who are determined to keep the rich history of Kuala Kubu Baru alive. Mr. Muhammad Rizwan Idris was born and bred here. He now dedicates his time to compiling data and drawings of the town's history, and he hopes that the town council will do more to restore the old quarters that have fallen into disrepair. Our role here is to preserve the history, tell the people about the rich history of this town. KKB has many firsts. He has the first retreat in the country, Bukit Kutu there, and then we have first lady to become an MP. <laughs> His friends, Madam Zawiya and her sister Zakia, are descendants of palace dignitaries known as Orang Besa Istana, appointed to supervise the local Malay customs and traditions. We mix with the Chinese and the Indians and we are using the same language, that is the English. We are very close, we are like family, you know. It's no barrier, no racist, nothing. When we compare, I mean now with the youngsters, the Chinese we go to the Chinese and the Malay we go to the Malay and they go to the Indians. Although their children have migrated to the cities, KKB, they said, will always have a special place in their hearts. To change the whole thing to be a modern city or modern town, no, 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 we don't want it. Because it's a place where, number one, we know everybody, the warm of the local. Everybody knows everybody. There's no stranger. In recent years, KKB has seen a steady stream of visitors, especially during weekends, drawn by its many outdoor activities and its food. Mr. Woon is 76 years old. Now, he's been making kaya puffs that are well known across Malaysia for more than three decades. And he and his relatives are still making them with their own hands, without using any machines. I'm just going to help out. 
The secret why his kaya puffs are always so light and flaky, he said, is because he uses two different types of pastries rolled down together. Today, his customers come from all over the country. But though business is booming, he's worried about the town's future. Like Mr. Woon, many locals also said that they're worried about what the future might hold. I can see that a um, few forests has been cut down, a few days. No, we, we want to, as a local, we don't need to develop that way. But the authorities up there, they still look for the money. You know? We don't want Tesco, we don't want Econ Safe or what we don't, we, we don't want. We, are, we, we, we just stick to our bricks and butter for your businesses. Today, there are increasing signs of gentrification. Many city dwellers, including artists and entrepreneurs, have made KKB their home away from home in these villas dotted across the hill slopes. It's, it's a double-edged sword. With the construction of the, the North-South Highway, a lot of these old small towns are dying because uh, people are not passing through it anymore. So uh, when there is a new population coming in, it's not necessarily bad. Uh, that's how I see it, but it's how we manage to control the, uh, the development. On top of rising development, KKB is also threatened by the effects of climate change, including landslides and flash floods. Climate change, we cannot control. Uh, and also, it happens everywhere. But what we can control is the human factor. Even slight uh, overdevelopment, it will affect. Because in nature, we do connect with each other. If managed well, it could follow the way of Ipo, a former sleepy mining town to Malaysia's rising tourism star, just about two hours' drive from KKB. Or it could end up as just another small town, slowly forgotten over time.